All right, let's look at an example and figure out what the correlation coefficient is, and we're gonna use technology. So there's a step-by-step -step instructions here. You can go through that on your own, or you can watch this video to see how it is. So we're gonna go back to this first page of the notes, the chirps per second and the crickets. And we're gonna input these into GeoGebra Classic, okay? Uh, specifically, we're gonna we'll go back to that spreadsheet, just like, like we used in previous units. We were looking at single variable data. Now we have two kinds of data that we're gonna talk about together. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over here and uh, we're going to grab, we are gonna copy paste this data. I don't want to be using that. So just highlight all the data. And sometimes GeoGebra is a little picky about what you can copy and paste. We're gonna see whether it's happy here. All right, so it's not happy here, right? We need these in two separate columns. GeoGebra is a little finicky, but that's sort of what you get when you have a free program. So if it does that, just go real quickly and just uh, type it in manually, all right? Um, we can do that right here. 80, 76, get some good uh, number pad, 10 key practice. I was always bad at that. My mom had us take typing classes and uh, I was pretty good at normal typing, but I was never really good with the number pad. I'm getting a little bit better. All right, so you should have data in two columns. Once your data is in two columns, just highlight both columns. And now instead of clicking one variable analysis, which gave us histograms and bar charts, we're gonna use two variable analysis, which is gonna give us, look at the picture, a scatter plot, and eventually we're gonna do some lines. So this should look pretty similar to our data that we, our scatter plot that we graphed. It's gonna look a little different than our personal scatter plot that I did in mine because the y-axis is scaled differently and that's okay. Um, but it should have the same shape. And again, we can see that, yeah, there's kind of weak correlation, right? These data points aren't super close together, but there is positive correlation, right? We kind of have this shape, kind of are, have a positive slope going on here. And I also mentioned that there were a bunch of, uh, oh, that's not showing up on the preview for some reason, but that's fine. So this is how we graph things with a scatter plot. So um, what is the correlation between the number of trips per second with crickets and weather? So in terms of our, our explanations, yes, it looks roughly linear, right? If we tried to model this, we could probably model this with a straight line. We wouldn't model it with a parabola or with a sine graph or with a logarithmic anything. We could model this with a straight line. So for 1a, we could say it's linear. Um, look at all of the things that we should be using to talk about this. Is it linear? What's the form? What's the direction? Positive, negative. How strong is the correlation? Any outliers, and again, we're not gonna really deal with groupings here. Groupings show like qualitative aspects of the data. We're just gonna look at two quantitative things. So yeah, our case is linear, it's positive, and I'd say it's weak. All right. Um, are there any outliers? Eh, maybe, but the correlation's so weak, it's kind of harder to visually look at outliers. And there's no groupings here. Okay. Uh, it should look like our scatter plot from before. Write a brief description of the association. Kind of just wants us to interpret the answer from part A. Um, it's linear, so, you know, um, the data points. Uh, kind of all the way line. That's how to explain that one. Positive means as uh, we increase X, remember that's our explanatory variable. Um, y, our response variable, increases as well. That's what that positive means. Uh, and then weak, the data points are not very 
close to together, right? They're, they're kind of spread apart, not close to a line. Bunch of ways to describe this. I'm kind of using plain English, like use English to kind of answer or explain what these uh, numbers from above mean. So do these results confirm that an increase in temperature leads to a higher number of chirps? And again, just like in the first one, they know these are correlated, just like the first video here. But it doesn't tell us causation. Maybe they are. And I'm no biologist, but from my five minute research, it looked like, yeah, maybe, maybe it is caused. But our scatter plot doesn't tell us that. So let's incorporate R, right? We're, we're supposed to be talking about using GeoGebra to find R. Let's look at R for all of these. Okay. So if it's linear and positive and weak, what do we think R is going to look like? It's positive and weak. So our R value should be also a positive number, but since it's weak, it should be close to zero. So we're looking for a, a number that's kind of close to zero and positive. Close-ish zero and positive. Let's find our correlation coefficient. And again, that's going to be very similar to what we did earlier in this class. Hit this button up here, show statistics. And it tells us a whole bunch of things. What's the average temperature? What's the average cricket chirps per six seconds? There's sample standard deviations. Um, and R is our correlation coefficient. So our R is actually pretty close to one. So I initially said that this data, data looked pretty weakly correlated, but um, the numbers say that this is actually pretty strong correlation. These data points are actually pretty close together. Okay, so our R value is equal to 0 0.8135 approximately. 8135. So we use that and say, okay, it's not actually weak correlation. It's strong correlation. And that's the nice thing about R, right? Visually, you might look at something and say, yeah, these look pretty spread apart. But then the math, the numbers will give you a, a more, a less fuzzy answer, a less gray answer, okay? One of the real advantages to looking at this correlation coefficient, okay? So we're going to say that they're moderately close together. And update our answer here. Doesn't change our answer to part C. That's how we find R, the linear correlation coefficient, and that's how we can use it. And a great example of the benefit of using it. And this leads us to a, a new thing as well. We had standard deviation sigma, variation with sigma squared. Well, we have the linear correlation coefficient and also the coefficient of determination sometimes written as a little r squared, sometimes written as a big r squared. And as you might expect, it's just taking r and squaring it. So the coefficient of determination tells us what percentage of the variation in the y values, so what percentage of the y, the y differences can be explained by a regression line, which we haven't really talked about a regression line yet. But it basically says it's one way of another way of modeling the relationship between X and Y and how closely correlated they are. So in R's, it tells us our R value. The R squared value is just found by squaring this R. Okay. So in our case, R squared is going to be 0 0.8135 squared which is going to be approximately equal to 
0.6618. As a side note, this coefficient of determination is usually, whoa, usually written as a percent. Right? Tells us the percentage of the variation that can be explained. So we'll say that about 66%, let's write this out as an explanation. It'll want us to do that later. About 66% of the variation in Y, what is Y here? Y was the chirps per second. About 66% of the cricket or the variation um, in English is hard for me today. About 66% of the variation in the, um, the cricket chirping can be explained by the temperature X. Okay. So it's not explaining all of it, right? The stronger the correlation, the bigger R squared is going to be. Um, but it's explaining about two-thirds of it here. It's another way of thinking about correlation. And that's an interpretation of the coefficient of determination. We'll use that a little bit more in the future videos. Specifically, the next one right after this is going to be an example, another example, to reuse these terms. And again, we haven't talked about the regression line just yet. But a little spoiler for the future. We can make a little regression line with a scatter plot on GeoGebra, and it will give us a line that goes right there. There's a regression model button, and it's going to give us an equation of a line that predicts things, and there's a bunch of things that we can say about this line. And again, yeah, I guess from this point of view, you can see that the points are actually pretty close to the line on average. Anyway, that's in the future. No spoilers in this, uh, in this math class. Have a good one.